Brace yourself, my sweet summer theorists. Tinfoil is coming. <laughs> I am terrible at accents. internet welcome to film theory remember a lannister always pays his debts but for everyone else there's mastercard all right so if you haven't figured it out yet i love game of thrones i'm a danny fan an aria file and most definitely on team Tyrion. i mean seriously this channel is less than 10 episodes and we're already doing a second video on it but believe me there's good reason Blog placement. Seriously, TV Club, embed this video in time for the season 5 finale. Okay, so shamelessly feeding the entertainment media's content churn aside, I really do eagerly wait every week for new episodes of this series. The world of Ice and Fire has some of the deepest lore of any modern fantasy universe, and the best thing about it is that it's still unfolding. Unlike some other major fantasy standbys like the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter, we actually get to see the whole Game of Thrones saga on screen before the series is actually finished. On that note though, Gur Martin, if you're listening to me, really start to wrap this series up because I'm not okay with cliffhangers here. Seriously, my friend, none of us are getting any younger, especially you. In any case, one thing I love so much about good old Got is that the back history of its universe actually starts thousands of years before any of the books begin. We've just now started to see some of the old legends of Westeros become a reality, and that leaves tons of theorizing about everything that's still coming. One of the topics I'm most excited about, though, is a very specific prophecy that has some serious implications on how the entire course of this series is gonna play out. And before I get too much deeper into that, let me just say right here, there are some spoilers ahead. We'll be covering one prophecy that's brought up in the book that's yet to be covered in the TV show. Everything else will be evidence drawing from the TV show itself. So, if you're okay hearing about a prophecy that may come into play down the line and are caught up with the episodes, great, you should be fine. But don't you go telling me that I didn't warn you about spoilers. And if my theory's right, well then, more spoilers? But, you know, it's just a theory. Wait, save that for the end. So one of the most interesting concepts introduced to viewers on Game of Thrones is the mythical religion centered around Rolor. Rolor. Rolon. Roller. These things are just so needlessly difficult. The mythical religion centered around the Lord of Light and the Heart of Fire. As you might be able to tell by his unimaginative titles, he's a god of light and fire. It's pretty self-explanatory actually. He's the one all the red priests are super excited about when they're burning people at the stake and doing kinky stuff with leeches. These guys are doing everything from seeing visions in flames to bringing people back from the dead and other weird stuff like birthing shadow baby assassins. I don't know. I mean, yeah, some of it is pretty extreme. But in terms of proving your god's existence, these powers seem awfully legitimate. The case is even better when you compare them with the other Westeros religions like the Faith of the Seven, which Seriously? We haven't seen anything out of these guys, and there's supposed to be seven of them? Good teamwork there, friends. And then you have the old gods, who don't seem to do all that much except for grow some nifty trees. So where's the theory? Well, in the religion of the Lord of Light, the god R'hllor is the sworn enemy of another god known as the Great Other, much easier to pronounce. They're designed to be equal and opposite forces in the world. It starts to get more relevant when we find out that this Great Other is the entity supposedly controlling the White Walkers, those ice zombies with the sparkling baby blue eyes that come from beyond the wall. According to official Game of Thrones lore, years before the events of the book series, one of R'hllor's heroes rose up and defeated the White Walkers against the Great Other. For all the years in between that event and the events in the series, these two didn't do all that much. But now that we hear that winter is coming... Winter is coming. 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 Winter. Yes, yes, okay, we get it. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. We get it. Thank you. Now that winter is coming, it seems the White Walkers are back, which means that the Great Other is back with them. So, with the White Walker invasion becoming more and more of a threat, one activity everyone should really be doing instead of making out with their siblings and flaying people 
was reading up on their own history. If they did, they would find out plenty about how the hero of R'hllor defeated the White Walkers last time. Or maybe they could watch this video instead. That's also a possibility. The Walker Slayer, no, not that Walker Slayer, this Walker Slayer, was Azor Ahai, and lived roughly 8,000 years before the events of the main series, during everyone's favorite, The Long Night. The stories the characters tell about it vary slightly, but it's just as that during The Long Night, the entire world was dark. Everyone starved, and the White Walkers attacked Westeros. Azor Ahai was chosen by R'hllor to defeat the White Walkers, but to do that, he needed a weapon that would actually kill them. As we've seen in the show, using traditional weapons against these things just get them shattered into a cool spray of CGI. So what did Azor Ahai do? His first attempt at forging a sword to take down the White Walkers involved him working the sword for 30 days and nights, but when he dipped the blade into water to temper it, it shattered. Alright, so take two. His second time out, he worked the metal for 50 days and nights, then captured a lion and plunged it into his chest to temper it in the lion's blood. It shattered again. On his third and final attempt, he worked it for 100 days and nights, and sadly pierced his own wife's heart to temper the blade. This time, it worked. Thank goodness, because otherwise that would have just been a really awful waste of time and a wife. Actually, if you think about it, it's still pretty awful anyway. Moving on, the point was the steel combined with the soul of his wife to become the sword Lightbringer, a weapon that would make anything coming in contact with the blade burst into flames. According to legend, Azor Ahai used the blade to beat back the White Walkers and put an end to the dark night full of terrors that we hear Lady Melisandre talk about incessantly. Jeez. You know, when you think about it, this show is really good at hammering home its catchphrases into your head. Winter is coming. Coming. The night is dark and full of terrors. All men must die. Lannister always pays his debts. Valar Vagulis, whatever the Bravos people say. Point is, this show's good at branding. And like all the best heroes in fantasy novels, there exists a prophecy that one day, after an especially long summer, the long night would come again. White Walkers with it. The new hero, whose job it would be to take down those White Walkers, would be recognized by a specific set of characteristics. He would have the blood of a dragon, would be born, quote, amidst smoke and salt as a bleeding star shines in the sky, end quote. And after his birth, dragons would follow shortly. And thanks to these characteristics, people would know that the prince that was promised had come. Pretty exciting stuff. So the goal of today is to identify who is the prince that was promised. And we have a few candidates. When we first meet her in the series, Lady Melisandre believes our savior will be good old Stannis all sulk and no play Baratheon. And he buys into the prophecy himself, setting up weird rituals to try and fulfill the requirements, but does he? Technically, he has the blood of the dragon from some distant Targaryen ancestor, but I'm not really sure about that smoke and salt thing. He burns people alive and was reborn through the religion, maybe? Then there's the question of the bleeding star. Unlike certain other characters we'll talk about, he has no connection with the bleeding star that we saw in the sky throughout season one. So Stannis? Yeah, it's a bit of a stretch. I don't see this one holding water. However, we do have have other options, with the most obvious being Daenerys Targaryen. In a story that's packed with protagonists, antagonists, and anti-heroes, she's probably the closest thing to a main character we're gonna get. Her arc follows a fairly archetypical hero journey, where she starts with basically nothing, then finds a cause worth fighting for and believing in, freeing all slaves. She grows, then she learns, suffers hardships and betrayals, and eventually becomes a great leader. So it would seem like that puts her into a prime position, but more importantly, she fulfills the prophecy. Let's look at our checklist. Danny is definitely a Targaryen, so she has a direct tap on the blood of the dragon. That's easy. And though we don't know much about her birth, in the series we see her rebirth. After the death of everyone's favorite set of pectorals, Khal Drogo, Danny walks into her former husband's funeral pyre. The next day, she's still alive with dragons in tow, naked as the day she was born. It's symbolic that she's been reborn. She's no longer a follower, a mother, or or a wife to a great leader, she is the great leader, the queen, the one who will rule over the Seven Kingdoms. So you see, not all nudity in the series is senseless, just most of it. And that scene checks two important qualifications off our list. Born
Thorn and Smoke, and with Dragons shortly following. Then, to top it all off, during the ritual where she became the Mother of Dragons, a Red Messenger, otherwise known as a Comet, appeared over Essos and Westeros, the symbol that passes pretty nicely for a bleeding star. So then, what about being born of salt? Well, one of the biggest and earliest tests of her role as a leader was getting the Dothraki across the Narrow Sea. Seas consist of salt water, born of smoke and salt. The only real qualification here she's missing is the whole prince thing, but hey, George R.R. is a progressive dude, so maybe gender stereotypes don't apply here. On the other hand, she's not the only near-perfect match. There's another candidate in the running for this prophecy, one who only just made the cut, Jon Snow. If our last Game of Thrones theory is correct, Jon is the son of Lyanna Stark and Rhaegar Targaryen, making him the only other living Targaryen in the world other than Danny, And that means dragon's blood. Big check number one. But just having the blood of the dragon doesn't necessarily fulfill the other parts of the prophecy. Luckily for Jon, though, we see in Season 5's episode Hard Home that he possesses a sword able to take down the White Walkers. So that's another point for him. The big question here, though, is was he born amid salt and smoke? Eh, kinda, but only if you squint at it real hard. His actual birth took place at the end of one of the biggest wars in Westeros. So salt and smoke there, I guess? Or it could refer to another birth of his, his birth into the night. Watch. While Danny was across the narrow sea producing dragons from the biggest s'mores roast ever, Jon Snow was having a crisis of conscience at the wall. At the outbreak of the War of Five Kings, when his old home had just been burned to the ground, he left the Night's Watch and was only rounded back up by Sam, his lovable comic relief. Well, not a literal birth, this was the actual moment when Jon Snow left his old life behind and committed to the Night's Watch. We've never seen him waver in this commitment since that point in the show, except for that whole egret thing, but it is reasonable to except this moment is Jon's birth into the Night Watch, which also coincides with the timing of the same comet over Danny. And another point in his favor here is that he's a guy, and the prophecy promised a prince. So there you go. Between their personalities, histories, and abilities, Jon and Danny are both pretty ideal candidates. So shouldn't this episode be over now? Why is there still a whole nother page of text that I have to read? The only problem with one of these two fulfilling the prophecy is the author who wrote the prophecy. Our buddy George isn't your typical fiction series writer. He stated in the past that while he loves classic fantasy writers like J.R.R. Tolkien, he believes that the traditional fantasy tropes a lot of them created have hurt fantasy fiction more than they've helped. That's a direct quote. As a result, he intentionally goes out of his way to avoid them with A Song of Ice and Fire. And even if he hadn't stated that explicitly, you can see it in the books. Main characters die. All the time. Good, bad, somewhere in the middle. They just up and die. Some go unceremoniously, without long goodbyes, without without redemption, without fulfilling a heroic destiny. It's that unpredictability that makes this series so great, and what makes me believe that neither Danny nor Jon Snow are actually the heroes from the prophecy. Gurr Martin himself has said that, quote, prophecies are a double-edged sword. You have to handle them carefully. They can add depth and interest to a book, but you don't want to be too literal or too easy, end quote. And that's the problem with Jon and Danny. It's too easy. Instead, knowing that George R. R. Martin is the type of author who enjoys sadistic plot twists, our prince that was promised is someone who also meets all the requirements of the prophecy, but will have a much harder time having to live with its consequences. And that someone is... Sir Jorah Mormont. That's right, I submit to you that this banished, scaly-skinned, friend zone deserter is gonna save the world from snow zombies. Wow, when I put it that way, it really looks like he has a long road ahead of him. But Jorah Mormont fits the bill. Let's think this through. Let's start with his birth conditions. We've established that for all our candidates, birth can be defined as a moment when you're born into a new life. Danny's funeral pyre moment also applies to Ser Jorah. No, he didn't survive an inferno or give birth to dragons, but he did make an important vow at that moment. In season 5, Jorah tells Tyrion it was that moment he decided to commit his life to Danny, abandoning the whole prospect of ever going back to Westeros. A new life. A rebirth in the 
smoke of a funeral pyre. And just like Jon Snow, he committed to a new destiny that we've never seen him leave, even when Danny is kicking him out every other episode. And he also did it under the same red messenger as the other two, the comet streaking across the sky, and with dragons coming shortly thereafter. So you might be asking yourself, what about the salt? Well, again in season 5, when he and Tyrion are attacked while sailing through the ruins of old Valeria, Jorah contracts grayscale, an often fatal disease that leaves the skin stiff and dead. A new chapter of his life begins in this moment that just so happens to take place on salty seawater. I can see it. I almost have you convinced, but I know that there's still one big missing piece here. The blood of the dragon. And save your comments, you're right, Jorah is no Targaryen. But notice that the prophecy doesn't state that the hero is the blood of the dragon. It states that he has the blood of the dragon, and that could mean a lot of things. We assume it's having the blood pumping through your veins, but it could just be referencing his sword possessing the blood of the dragon, say by killing a dragon. We have seen these dragons lash out at Danny in the past, and Jorah would do anything to protect her. And before you think I'm reading too much into this, consider the following. In his second attempt to temper his blade, Azor Ahai captured a lion and pierced its chest. What did Jorah just do earlier this season, capture a lion, Tyrion of House Lannister. And what did Azor have to do in the end to produce the blade that would end the night? Pierce the heart of his beloved wife. Who else in this series loves someone as deeply and sincerely as Jorah loves Daenerys? Certainly not Ramsay and Sansa, I'll tell you that. Ooh, too soon? But joking aside, if George R. R. Martin truly wants to throw fantasy tropes out the window and shock us even more than the red and purple weddings, Jorah being the Prince of Prophecy, forced to kill Danny in order to retrieve the blood of the dragon just so he can stop the White Walkers, that would certainly do it. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Welcome back to the Super Amazing End Card Tournament! So, who do you think is the prince that was promised? It's gotta be one of the three, Danny, John, or Jorah, so click on the one you think it's gonna end up being, and check back next time to see who won. But before you vote, remember, the night is dark and full of terrors, so subscribe. Oh, I'm sorry, did I forget to mention that part of the prophecy? Yeah, here, let me read it to you. Quote, Ye who subscribe shall pass through the night with the guidance of a great theorist. End quote. Uh, yeah. So don't let R'hllor down. Come on, baby. Light that fire. Subscribe. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to watch that White Walker battle scene again. It was incredible. Maybe one of the strongest episodes of the series so far. Tyrion and Danny finally getting a chance to talk. Ah, uh, awesome. Fanboying? Out.